the Gerontological Society of America Momentum Discussions. Welcome to the Momentum Discussion podcast series, where researchers, educators, and practitioners stimulate dialogue on trends with great momentum to advance gerontology. The content of our podcast today was designed by GSA, along with our clinical partner, the Gerontological Advanced Practice Nurses Association. This program has received an educational grant from Azi Pharmaceuticals. Welcome to the podcast. My name is Elizabeth Gallick, and I'm a nurse practitioner, professor, and chair at the University of Maryland School of Nursing. I'm also a fellow of the GSA and a past president of the Gerontologic Advanced Practice Nurses Association. I'm really excited to be your host for this podcast that will focus on successful conversations with older adults about sleep disturbance. And I'm pleased to be speaking today with Dr. Michael Vitiello, who is a professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at the University of Washington in Seattle. He's an internationally recognized expert in sleep, circadian rhythms, and sleep disorders in aging. His research is funded by the National Institutes of Health and focuses on the causes, consequences, and treatments of disturbed sleep, circadian rhythms, and cognition in older adults. He is the author of over 500 scientific articles, reviews, chapters, editorials, and abstracts. He's also the editor-in-chief of Sleep Medicine Reviews and has served as president of the Sleep Research Society and chair of the Sleep Disorders Research Advisory Board of the National Institute of Health. Welcome, Dr. Vitiello. Thanks, Beth. That's very kind of you, and it's a pleasure to be here today. Well, I think our audience is in for a treat today with all of your expertise. Let me start with an important question. How can clinicians briefly explain to their patients how sleep changes with age? Well, there's a simple answer and a more complex answer, and I'm going to give you both. The simple answer is that practitioners should expect their older adults to experience sleep change. That's mostly a lightening of sleep uh, so that there's not the depth of sleep, the deep sleep that one experiences earlier in life. And there's more fragmentation. That is, there's more frequent wakenings from sleep and possibly a little more difficulty getting back to sleep. That being said, the underlying causes for those rather simple and broad changes are much more complex, and it's important for practitioners to appreciate them. In fact, there's good reason to believe that most sleep disturbances and most sleep disorders uh, are not the result of aging per se, but are rather more associated with health problems and uh, are therefore treatable. It's also important to recognize that that just simply growing old doesn't mean you're going to sleep poorly. Uh, To give you an example of that, the epidemiological data is very consistent. It tells you that, or tells us, that about 50% of the older population, that's 60 plus, complain of regular sleep difficulties. And that's a big problem. But it also tells us that there's another half of the population that aren't complaining, even though they do experience some change. And so there's something going on that isn't simply the process of aging. And that's very encouraging because we can't reverse aging, but we can treat other problems. And most sleep disturbances are worthy of examination because they're uh, potentially treated. Thanks so much for that very comprehensive answer. Could you please share with us why healthcare providers should initiate a conversation with older patients about their sleep? It sounds like a lot of it's going to have to do with comorbidities. You're quite right, but there's no guarantee of that. Very often, and there have been studies to demonstrate this, an older adult or any patient in primary care will come in with a complaint, and they may also have a sleep complaint, but they may not volunteer it. And if you ask them, roughly 30 to 40% of people typically also have a sleep complaint they might bring up. But practitioners, of course, have limited time, and uh, they always have to allocate it carefully. I noted above that sleep disturbances are typically associated with poor health and are treatable, but there's another side to that equation. Uh, Sleep disturbances can also impair health, that is, make existing conditions worse. And in fact, there's an emerging literature that says if you successfully treat a sleep disorder, you can often improve a comorbid disorder. 
And so that interaction really makes, uh, it's, it's clear that sleep is essential in good health and can both be compromised by illnesses, but also make illnesses worse. And uh, that's one of the reasons why, at least in the sleep community, we think that sleep should be considered a vital sign and worthy of regular appraisal. That sounds like a great suggestion, incorporating that into um, your visits, checking on people's sleep. So in busy primary care practices and also in post-acute and long-term care settings, healthcare providers might be a little concerned about asking older adults about their sleep as they may find that there's insufficient time to assess and address patient concerns. They kind of don't want to open up Pandora's box, so to speak. Um, that, that's very true, and, and I recognize that. So how one approaches it is really going to vary by setting. Uh, let's let's talk about primary care optimally. A patient could be queried every time they come in to primary care if we were going with the vital sign approach. But we recognize that that's probably not appropriate. Uh, it simply can't be done in the modern clinical setting. However, an annual health visit, when you're doing a general review of health, and which is mandated for older adults, is a very good time to explore the possibilities of a sleep problem. Uh, and you can open the question very simply by asking, how have you been sleeping? And seeing what the response may be. And the annual health visit then allows you the possibility to explore. Now, as far as the concern of opening Pandora's box, nobody's expecting a primary care provider to become a sleep expert and to treat sleep disorders, or even to fully diagnose them. But they can find the tip of the iceberg and let the size of the iceberg be determined by experts. And as with anything else, a primary care practitioner has to be ready to refer to appropriate experts to follow up if there's a concern that they feel they can't handle. It's very easy in the annual health visit to explore that and get a sense of what's going on. And in fact, during that annual health visit, you can use some simple questions to probe and get and get the kind of answers that can then allow you to refer, if you will. Uh, in more complex situations like in post-acute care or in particular long-term care, you can take a much more considered approach uh, because you have more time. But again, for most practitioners, it's going to be determining there's a problem and then referring appropriately. Thanks very much. So what do you find are the most common sleep disorders among older adults? Well, the, the big one is insomnia, followed by obstructive sleep apnea, uh, which is a, a difficulties breathing during the night, which result in multiple frequent awakenings. And then there's a neurological disorder called restless leg syndrome, where uh, one's when you go to bed, your legs and often your limbs kind of feel very odd and result in movement to quell that feeling, and that can keep you awake quite a bit. Uh, a bit less common, but still present in older adults are also circadian rhythm disorders, which are more disorders of when sleep occurs, the timing of sleep against the clock. Those are the common ones that one sees. There are others, but those are the biggies. So what are some of the best ways to screen or conduct case finding for sleep disturbance among older adults? I know GSA sponsored a webinar not too long ago that addressed some of this, but maybe you could summarize a few things for us. Answering this thoroughly would take more time than we have here. I mean, as you said, there's a webinar that it began to address it. However, I can make some recommendations. I can actually recommend a, an excellent uh, resource, a very rich resource. This was something that I was involved in. I co-authored a consensus conference where a group of uh, sleep experts that had geriatric expertise and a, and a group of geriatricians got together and reviewed the literature and came up with evidence-based recommendations for treating sleep disorders. We published this in the Journal of the American Geriatric Society back in I think it's 2009 now, and that's entitled Evidence-Based Recommendations for the Assessment and Management of Sleep Disorders in Older uh, Persons. And it's very comprehensive, including a section on long-term care issues. It provides an excellent overview of the best ways to screen or conduct case findings for sleep disturbance and spoke to the state-of-the-art treatment at that time, mm -hmm. which hasn't changed. And it included a very useful diagnostic flowchart 
that if one wanted to explore and try to parse out which particular problem might be present for that individual, uh, would be very helpful in making the differential diagnosis. And I think that's going to be made available as a, a reference uh, somewhere in the, this block. Yes, I, I think we're going to be able to provide the full citation at the end of the session. It, I, I was actually checking it out the other day, and that diagnostic flowchart is really helpful in trying to tease things apart so that you know you can at least make a preliminary diagnosis before sending folks on to a sleep expert. Yeah, let, let me speak to that a tiny bit. Let me just give it in brief. It's a flowchart that really... If you query the individuals, the complaints you're going to get usually fall into three general categories, and that begins the diagnostic process. Uh, one grouping, one bin might be problems falling asleep and staying asleep, and that's going to lead you to initially suspect insomnia, but you do have to go through some additional levels of screening before you can be confident about that. There's another common complaint that will lead you down a different pathway, and that's a person who has excessive daytime sleepiness. It's almost antithetical for us to think of this way, but people with insomnia don't necessarily talk about being sleepy during the day. They mostly focus on their difficulties at night. People who uh, talk about excessive daytime sleepiness are probably in another diagnostic situation, and the principal culprit there may well be obstructive sleep apnea. But again, you have to go through the diagnostic uh, yes, no kind of checklist and, and move things along. Then there's a third group, which their complaints are going to be unusual sleep-related behaviors or movements that occur at night. And there, um, you're probably moving down a restless leg pathway, but again, you need to make an accurate differential diagnosis. And the flowchart provides those choice points and those questions and where it goes beyond that. And as you said, we'll give them the full citation at the end of this. So if your older patient is experiencing a sleep complaint, what medical workup would be appropriate in primary care? And when would it be appropriate to refer to a specialist? The medical workup is very much patient-based, both in terms of the profile of the person's health, their environmental situation, their personal factors. Very often, for example, uh, you can make a diagnosis of insomnia with, with really mostly by ruling out things. So if there's no reason to suspect something else, there's no reason to order tests. But it sometimes gets complicated. If you have an older adult uh, who has multiple comorbidities, uh, you may have to do some additional diagnostics. And this is going to depend, uh, even ordering additional testing, is going to depend on the expertise and the comfort of the primary care provider. Uh, if they feel they're well-versed and this is an area that they're willing to go down, uh, then they can make those decisions. But much of that uh, would be done in the handoff to a, a sleep center or a practitioner that has expertise specifically in sleep medicine. So what if you're practicing in a rural setting or a location that doesn't really have close or reasonable access to a sleep specialist? What can you do? Well, it's interesting. This is perhaps the upside of the COVID epidemic. It's forced almost everyone, regardless of their site, to start doing remote practice. So Unless you had to come in for a sleep study per se, a lot of practitioners can do these types of things over telehealth or uh, the kind of communication platforms that are available to almost everyone, even if it meant going to a library. So, or so you could work with your primary care practitioner at their office and awesome. get an interview with someone at a sleep center who's 50, 80, 100 miles away. So that's becoming easier. I wouldn't say it's necessarily a guarantee, but those are the types of things that can be explored. Also, most major cities now have multiple sleep centers. And so anybody within 50, 80 miles of that area can probably easily contact that center. And those are the types of point of referrals that practitioners should be looking for in their area. So if you suspect that your patient has insomnia, what important distinctions need to be made to inform recommending, let's say, a pharmacologic intervention or a non-pharmacological treatment approach? 
Well, anybody uh, that's complaining of insomnia could probably benefit for, uh, with a review of what we call sleep habits. Those are the things that they do uh, and the environment they have their sleep in uh, that might improve their situation. But if they're coming in with, you know, complaints about, I, I have very difficult times getting to bed or staying asleep, the biggest dividing line in, in both diagnosis and in ultimate treatment is chronicity, how long the person has had the problem. A person can easily experience sleep disturbance that's situational or transient. So you get fired from a job. Uh, you have a major financial difficulty, a death of a, a loved one. All of those things, uh, anticipatory problems with a, a new job interview, whatever it might be, all lead to insomnia in, in individuals. Not everybody, but, but often. That type of problem is usually going to resolve, but you can treat it, and that's the role of pharmacotherapy. You want to decide to match the, the drug profile of action with the problem, and you want to recommend for the shortest period of time. You don't want somebody going on and on with uh, pharmacotherapy for insomnia. And in fact, quite the opposite, in chronic conditions where we're talking months of insomnia or years of insomnia, and it's called chronic, the gold standard approach, which has been recognized by the American College of Physicians, is cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a behavioral treatment, which is now becoming more and more readily available. Uh, that's another whole topic, but uh, that that's the approach that should be made first and foremost with an insomnia that's chronic. That is more than a month or two in, in duration. So you know, I think you've kind of already addressed this. When might it be appropriate to consider pharmacologic intervention for treatment of insomnia of your older patient? It sounds like it's kind of counterintuitive. We, we think that people who have chronic insomnia, you might want to start a med with, but actually it's the, it's the reverse. Yeah, you can choose the med. And in fact, there's, you know, this is where you, you have to work with your patient. I mean, some people want a quick fix. And cognitive behavioral therapy is not necessarily a quick fix. It, it takes weeks. Uh, you can get benefit within within a week or two, but really it plays out over a period of, of a month. On the other hand, if someone wants uh, is demanding treatment, quote, and they have a chronic insomnia, you can also provide the drug, uh, again, appropriate to the symptomology, and there are different short-acting, long-acting, and, and there are newer drugs emerging on the market that are, even, that are safer still than what we've had in the past. And then also recommend getting CBT. But the thing with a situational insomnia, which, is very, which has just come on and is probably of limited duration, cognitive behavioral therapy may or may not be useful, but it's going to take too long to treat. And so that's where uh, you can intervene pharmacologically uh, in an appropriate manner because pharma pharmacology works immediately. Yeah. It also sounds like with CBT, you really need a motivated patient and you also need someone who has the cognitive capability to engage in that process. Yeah, uh, that, that's true, but I would provide a, a couple of caveats. You can motivate patients to some degree, you, mm -hmm. but you're right, you, you can't make the horse drink after you've led them to water. But you can ask them, uh, so do you want to be the man that has a fish and eats for a day or that learns how to fish and eats for the rest of their lives? Because that's what CBTI, cognitive behavioral therapy, is all about. It is a long-term solution. And some people don't want to be on medications for you know months and months if they don't have to be. In terms of cognitive ability, yes. You can't do this in a mid-stage Alzheimer's patient, for example, but you can institute aspects of it in community dwelling patients that have an early dementing disorder. So you wouldn't want to discount it necessarily. It just becomes more work, and then there has to be the commitment of the caregiver, obviously. Yes. Well, thanks for that clarification. Are there any new treatments for sleep disturbance on the horizon? Uh, there are a number. Actually, pharmacologically, let's let's start there. We kind of reached a stopping point when the Z drugs came out, now almost 25 years, which were a vast improvement on benzodiazepines, but and from the point of view of safety, from the view of efficacy, not that different. But 
there's been a discovery neurologically of a, a, an entirely different neurotransmitter system, and that orexin hypocretin system uh, really provides us with a different tool to treat insomnia. And those drugs have been emerging on the market uh, over the last five years or so. And they act in a different way. All the previous sedative drugs that were used to treat insomnia induced a sleep-like state. <laughs> that is, they caused, if you will, pharmac pharmacological sleep. These other drugs, the newer drugs, work in the opposite way. They suppress the wake drive that we all experience that's always balancing our need for sleep. And so they don't have some of the same side effects as the other drugs, uh, which were classic sedatives. And it's going to be interesting to see how they play out over time. And we may take a different attitude about their long-term use in the future, to be perfectly honest. I, I'm open enough to recognize that. So that's certainly one big thing that's on the horizon. Uh, just to give you another interesting treatment for obstructive sleep apnea, the classic treatment has always been some aspect of CPAP, that is uh, positive airway pressure into the airway, which sounds terrible, it isn't that bad. It's just enough air to keep your airway open and not collapsing, which it does in OSA, obstructive sleep apnea. But there's a new uh, procedure that, Think about it as the uh, same as a pacemaker. It's a little battery pack that's uh, worn subcutaneously under the skin, but the little electrical charges, instead of going to your heart to time it the way they do with a pacemaker, actually go to the muscles in your upper airway. And they time with your respiration so that it makes your tongue move forward as you inspire. And when your tongue moves forward, it opens up the airway behind it, and you can respirate better. And it, it really is a very potentially effective treatment for a lot of people with certain aspects of, of obstructive sleep apnea. That's been brand new within the last few years and uh, is beginning to have an impact. So there are lots of these things that are on the, on the margins that, that are in research or in early clinical stages. That's an exciting time. It sounds like it. And just know that we're going to have a chance to talk more with Dr. Vitiello and with several other of our colleagues, Dr. Christopher Kaufman from the University of Florida College of Medicine, Dr. Adam Spira from Johns Hopkins, Bloomberg School of Public Health, and Dr. Katie Stone from the University of California, San Francisco, when we, we talk more about treatment options and exciting innovations that are on the horizon. So just in conclusion, the citation that Dr. Vidiello mentioned is Bloom and colleagues, evidence-based recommendations for the assessment and management of sleep disorders in older persons. And it was published in the Journal of the American Geriatric Society in 2009 in May. So thank you so much for speaking with me today and to talk about how to have successful conversations with older adults about sleep disturbance. To learn more about the GSA and our initiative addressing sleep disturbances in older adults, visit geron.org. The Gerontological Society of America was founded in 1945 to promote the scientific study of aging, cultivate excellence in interdisciplinary aging research, and education to advance innovations in practice and policy. For more information about GSA, visit geron.org.